This is Joyce Ashaquan. She's an Indigenous woman, 37 in this photo, and the mother of seven. On September 28, 2020, she died in a hospital after being neglected by healthcare staff. Public outrage in Quebec this weekend. Joyce Echequan pleaded with staff to help her, but instead she was insulted in her last moments. You see it over and over again, and it needs to stop. When the media reported the story, many Canadians were shocked and horrified. For Indigenous communities, this was especially traumatizing. But it wasn't surprising. We experience racism every day as we navigate our lives in Canada. It's part of the long legacy of abuses like the Indian Act, residential schools, Indian hospitals, and a persistent belief that Indigenous ways of being are inferior to Western ones. These legacies have intergenerational effects that create ongoing barriers within education, the media discourse, government institutions, and yes, healthcare. Joy Sashaquan's death jolted healthcare leaders to recognize that systemic racism exists in our system. But where does it come from? Where else does it exist? And how can healthcare institutions begin to unravel it? Ane Bojo, Meyer Greenfield Indigenous, Kibwak First Nation Donjba, Giwe No Winkwe Donjba, Giwe No Winkwe Endayong, Nourish Ndonoki. You've probably seen photos in the media of $23 asparagus, a $71 watermelon, and an $18 cabbage for sale in Northern Indigenous communities. With the remote nature of these communities, the fresh and healthy foods that is shipped there is expensive compared to highly processed foods. But the story of the $18 cabbage is only the tip of the iceberg. Traditional and country foodways have provided nourishment for Indigenous communities for thousands of years. The land and water feeds us, and this food is our medicine. But through colonization, the land was stolen and the children were forced into residential schools where they were forbidden from learning the knowledge and culture of their ancestors. Hunting, fishing, harvesting wild foods and the indigenous foodways that supported our communities were impacted. I have heard elders say that these will take up to seven generations to rebuild. These factors are why communities have rates of diet-related illness like diabetes and heart disease that are double the Canadian average. This is part of an Indigenous health gap, where in almost every measure of health, Indigenous communities experience far worse outcomes than the rest of Canada. How do we close this gap? The solutions lie in our communities. For generations, knowledge keepers protected the cultural wisdom and relationship to the land that colonial policies tried to erase. And today, there is a movement of communities across Turtle Island who are strengthening traditional foodways. In recent years, many Canadian healthcare institutions have responded to this movement and started to examine their own colonial practices. They are building relationships with knowledge keepers and using their influence and purchasing power to support this movement. So the Food is Medicine was a month-long program that we ran revolving around traditional foods as medicine. So we had different elders and different uh, knowledge keepers in each area speak to the sessions that we were putting on each week. We did um, a few Zoom sessions and then we had a couple Facebook Lives as well as how-to videos. We also had different corresponding kits that went along with the different sessions that we held. So we had ice fishing kits, wild rice kits, it engaged a lot of community members to participate in something that maybe they wouldn't have participated in otherwise. Kind of wanted to bring back that feeling of community and that feeling of unity in the communities. There's just, there's just so much problems with just everything that had to do with colonialism and you know all of the knowledge that was lost and the language that was lost and we're in a state now where youth are kind of reclaiming that and they want to learn more about you know, where this food comes from and how our people used to survive here. My mom was a part of the 60s scoop and so I grew up away from my culture, away from my language, and I've just kind of been regaining it. I think it's just really important to get back to those teachings um, and to learn from the elders that are still here today because when they're gone, um, I don't know how else we're gonna learn the knowledge that they have to teach us. Our first goal was to add more traditional food items to our hospital menus across Saskatchewan. But our second and more important goal was really to engage our staff and inspire our work teams in a path towards cultural humility. 
we thought rather than just finding a recipe and, and trialing it with a few folks and then adding it to our menu, we really wanted to take the time to engage the staff. So to do this, we uh, invited five uh, well-known local Indigenous chefs from across Saskatchewan to our food production center in Saskatoon and asked them to prepare their favorite traditional meal using the local ingredients that were available and um, telling the stories of their food and their culture. Hospital menus really have not paid a lot of attention uh, to the cultural and traditional needs of the patients. And I think this is particularly important for Indigenous cultures because food is so intertwined with health and healing. I think that's a really presents a unique opportunity to find those ways to engage your work teams and to begin that culture shift. So the dream for me is, you know, healthy communities, healthy um, elders, and eating their own traditional foods. So the initiative was to reach out to Indigenous communities in the Interior Health Service area, to chat with community members, to, to look for recipes that are from the community, developed by the community, uh, consumed in the community and apply that if we can into dinner at home format. We have a need in healthcare to get traditional foods into the healthcare system, into long-term care systems, into elder centers. We have recipes coming in, we have communities engaged, we have source product that we can use for these dinner at homes that are traditionally harvested. You know, it's one step at a time. And, you know, we're, we were asked point blank, I was asked point blank, what are we going to do with the recipes? What am I going to do with the recipes? And what I've shared with the communities is the recipes aren't going anywhere. We will do this work, we will get it back to the community, and we will wait for feedback before this information goes anywhere. And then we will ask the community if they're interested in sharing it. I think it's important to culturally connect with your community, culturally connect with your past, you know, and, and see that value. I think food is the most important part of a culture. It's not a question of if it's going to happen. It's a question of who's going to do it. There is a growing recognition that if we wanted to colonize our institutions, close the Indigenous health gap, and make the promise of reconciliation a reality, it's time to unlearn old ways of thinking, confront biases in our institutions, and recognize the power of Indigenous foodways to transform healthcare. Indigenous communities are showing us the way, and when healthcare commits its resources and energy to this cause, they are practicing anchor leadership. Leadership that harnesses the resources and wisdom within healthcare and community to build health for all and to help build back better. If this is your healthcare institution, join our movement of anchor leaders.